Well, hello and welcome to the Gaelic Football Show here on Off the, on Off the Ball. We know you're used to normally hear nothing but rugby here on Rugby <laughs> FM. I mean Off the Ball, but to be none of that today, it's all about Gaelic football. I'm Shane Stapleton, with me in studio, I have Owen Shane. How are you doing, Owen? Not too bad. One defeat in the Six Nations and uh, already the awful ball is getting a slamming. And we've signed Ronan O'Gara to the team as well, which is incredible. You know I'm excited about it, and it's rugby and I want more of it. Yeah, exactly. It's good to see that you've actually appreciated the greater of our two codes, though, and you've actually finally taken upon yourself to make a football show. Look, we'll bring in Tommy Rooney before you have any more pops at me. You're a Mead Hill man. A Mead man, a Mead Hill man, yeah. yeah. County, county title winning man. Yeah, well, that's a couple of years ago now, Shane. Yeah. We, don't, we don't rest on old titles like yourself. Uh, you know, on, we aren't in here championing things like that these days. I'm still a reigning champion. But anyway, <laughs> we've, <laughs> we've been detroit. You're, you're going to abuse me now about being a hurling man. Well, not particularly. I, I think it's just really just welcoming you to the fold, that you've finally woken up to the possibilities that this great game presents, that, you know, it's far too easy to score in your game, obviously, and uh, it's a far more uh, intellectual game, uh, the great game of Gaelic football. So welcome aboard. It's great to have you. I guarantee you, you won't find anywhere me abusing Gaelic football. Loved Gaelic football since I was a young lad. And up until I was about 33, I think the only thing I'd ever won was a county minor title in football with Bursley. Now, to be fair... The father was the manager and he made me captain <laughs> on the mother's instructions. But I'm a big Gaelic football man. Where did he play? Well. Uh, full forward. Right, okay. Was it a big target man inside or was it kind of the, the new modern type of Gaelic footballer? Full forward, back as sweeper? Paul Ganey esque, uh, Michael Quinlevin esque. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that's where Quinlevin learned it. I think what? so, the dummy. You showed, you showed him a thing or two. <laughs> yeah, I think dummy, but in a very different sense. You are a hurling snob, though, Shane. <laughs> I'm a I don't know denying that. You are a hurling snob. Yeah, but can I love Gaelic football so. as well? I don't know, man. I, I really don't know. I really don't know. Well, You're going to have to convince me, to be fair. Well, I have a theory that hurling snobbery was actually founded in this very studio by Shane and Michael Verney last year. Like, the, the term hurling snobbery got about four mentions on the television for the All-Stars last year. And I was like, that phrase, I think, was, was coined <laughs> in this studio last summer and everybody else hopped on the bandwagon. So, we'll give you that. Do you know, a couple of years ago, um, the Examiner were doing a list of top 25 GA tweeters or whatever. And uh, I had, at the time, a, an apparent uh, hurling snob. And that was put on the paper as well. And I've had it thrown at me ever since. <laughs> You've had it there since, okay. So, you just try and own it. Um, Dublin are obviously going to win the All-Ireland again this year. We know that, but it's still going to be interesting to watch along the way. Kerry, they're now puke, puke football team. It's pretty obvious from the first two weeks under Peter Keane, isn't it? All? Expl explain that to me. Yeah, exp explain your theory to me that well, it is now puke football. We're going to do the tactics board a little bit later yeah. on. But the bottom line is Kerry aren't winning All-Ireland this year. I, I'm not necessarily sure if that's the case. I think, and a very brief point, I think Kerry can win the All-Ireland. And this has been the case ever since 2014 if they have their first choice full forward line fit. So in previous year, years, up, up until last year, between 2014 and last year, I, I would have always said, if you have Paul Ganey, James Donoghue and Kieran Donoghue, all fit, all firing, Kerry can challenge anyone. It is the best full forward line in the country, no question. Now that Kieran Donoghue has gone and replaced by David Clifford, it is still the best full, full forward line in the country, no question. I, I don't want to hear any other arguments. It, really? it, is, it, is, better than, it is better than Mannion Rock and Conor Callaghan. It, it, the Clifford, Ganey and James Donoghue combination, if fully fit and fully firing. Now the thing is, what are the chances of having all three of them fully fit and firing? Well, the answer is, it's quite low. Uh, we have not backing the S&C team in Kerry by the sounds of it. Well, I, I'm not backing the unfortunate luck that James Dunhu has been hit with. Like, I'm hearing bad things about his current injury at the moment that we might not actually see him before the end of the league. And he was actually named to start in the, the first day of the league and uh, in the match programme and didn't end up playing. I'm not sure we're actually going to see him before the end of that. The last time he played a full league was the year 2014, yeah. he was Footballer of the Year. He scored 3-3 in one of the games against Toronto that year. So he single-handedly holds the keys to not only Kerry winning an All-Ireland, but I actually think to Dublin not winning five in a row. You're talking about the full forward line, though. But, but the thing that Shane threw at you there, the jive that Shane went straight in with, was puke football. But sure, and two, you've two been of those to, three lads have it. I know, I know, but you've been to both Kerry games, and mm -hmm. it's about, like, with any team in any sport, it's about what's behind that full forward line. What's supplying it into them? How they're getting the ball to them? There's a number of teams out there at the minute who have great footballers, top quality footballers, footballers who make it into the Dublin side, say. But it's how they're getting the ball to them. And how they're not make brave it enough to carry it up. Well, it's not even. It's not even brave. Back. It's. I haven't seen Kerry in action like live at a, at a game yet under Peter Keane. What is he going? Like what is he doing? Like what is he going to do that's going to stop Dublin? And if they have the three boys fit, get the ball into them the right way. Well, I think the first thing he's going to do is actually get them within shooting range of Dublin. And that means not losing a game and underperforming massively like they did against Galway last year and for a lot of the game in Clonus as well last year, that they're not going to lose the teams that they shouldn't lose to. Like that game against Cavan at the weekend was, in a certain way, reminiscent of the game the last time they went to Cavan, which was two years ago, and they ended up drawing the game. They should have lost the game. I, I think this Kerry team, if they're good enough to beat a team, they will beat them. And that comes from, you call a puke football, 
at times, at times it has been puke football. The first half against Tyrone was puke football. It takes two to tango on that particular occasion, though. But they have dropped 15 behind the ball. There's, 15, there's, there's no denying that. 15 have full a partner in Cavan as well when it comes to puke football. Well, the, the, the black death, as they were previously described by Joe Bradley, now I think that's a bit harsh. Well, we'll see under Mickey Graham as well, and it must be unbelievably difficult for him to juggle being over Mullignacta facing into an mm. All-Ireland mm. club semi-final and being over a, a Cavan team for his first season as well. Incredibly tough. It's a good problem to have. And that's a, a neighbouring county of yours, Tommy, yeah. as well. But just to look at your own county, Meath, and we're going to get Paddy O'Rourke on the show shortly as well, who retired before the start of last season. As a Meath fan, do you look into the season and think, what's the point? Uh, I don't. No, I don't. Honestly, honestly, I don't. Um, I think it might be interesting to put it to Paddy, but I think that uh, a lot of the me teams that Paddy played on were running, were like things weren't going right. There was a, a lot of dysfunction. There was different managers in and out. There was players who would have made a big difference that were either injured or weren't around. And uh, at the same time, Dublin were becoming the machine and became the machine that they are. I think me this year. I think that uh, the feeling in the county at the minute is that. There's a lot of young lads in that team, and they're actually, I think, going to be given a bit of a, a bit of space to do something. Like McIntyre's in his, I think it's his third year now, so mm-hmm. I think he's been given a bit of space to put together what he's trying to do. Um, a lot of the young lads that he's brought in this year, I've been impressed with three or four of them, and um, I think they'll be given a bit of time. They're not going to like nobody in Leinster is going to beat Dublin, really. I don't agree with you that it's a sure thing that because we wouldn't be doing a Gaelic football show if it was a sure thing that Dublin going to win the All Ireland. I don't agree with you on that. Well, we did an NFL show and we knew the Pats were going to win that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Shane, we've done it. We have done a Six Nations and lots of rugby stuff. And we know Tipper are going to win the All Ireland. We're going to yeah, do a hurling yeah, yeah, show. Okay, okay, okay. Well, that's, that is a real foregone conclusion. <laughs> yeah, it certainly is. But like Mead's Mead year isn't going to be judged on Dublin. It's not. It's going to be judged on whether the likes of Derek Campion, um, Ronan Ryan. Uh, you know, James McIntyre stand up as meat footballers this year and you know progress it. It's it's still a work in progress. Mm. We've got Paddy O'Rourke on the line um, at the moment. How are you doing, Paddy? Good. How are you, lads? We're not too bad. We're not too bad. Um, obviously, you retired at the start of last year and did. A, I go through that column with you where you spoke about the fact that it's no longer um, it feels like the commitment is worth it. Nine, ten months of the year, putting in five, six nights a week. And then, you know, Dublin are, are obviously going to go ahead and win Leinster at a canter as they have done for so long. But before I ask you about that, I actually was reading some comments that Andy McEntee made at the weekend. And I thought they tied in somewhat into what you were saying because he was talking about a tiered competition. And he said, how can you justify training five or six nights per week for eight or nine months of the year, basically what you said, without a realistic... Oh, sorry, that is what you said. No, what he said was, if you could guarantee everybody three games, I think you'd have more buy-in from players. There's a lot of talk about people not committing to the county scene. But if you thought you were only going to get one or two games uh, in a year, that's probably one of the issues. And he's talking about a tiered competition there. So do you agree with what Andy's saying there? In a way, yeah. Um, I think the... The way that the structure is at the moment, um, obviously, it, in our situation in Mead, we're kind of looking at the Leinster draw and, and seeing, do we come out on the draw opposite to Dublin? You know, and once you come out on the draw opposite to Dublin, you kind of think, right, we've a, we've a realistic chance of being in a Leinster final, and then after that, you know, you, you, you regroup, you, you circle the wagons if if you can't beat Dublin in a Leinster final, and then you try and win your matches to get to the the um the super eight series going forward. But you know, the the last the last three three years has been quite demoralizing for players. You know, you, you put you go back into training in, in some time in October, you play your first round of, of Leinster Championship in June and we've been knocked out in the first round of the qualifiers in, in early July and, and it was even earlier this year that we got knocked out to uh, to Tyrone. So, you know, you, you kind of scratch your head and say the amount of effort, training, commitment gone in and that's our championship over. I think that that has to be, like, I don't know how the powers that be in the GEA can't see that as a real issue. Mm. The year that you've had out from the inter-county game, um, and you reflect on the column that we did last year as well, is it anything you regret? Are you happy with what you did? And have you enjoyed your last year more than you would have the previous couple of years when you've been toiling away with Mead? Um, I, I don't think anything can really replace the buzz of, of playing for the county. You know, playing in, in Navan on, on front of a home crowd and, and winning, winning a league match earlier in the year, you know, you, 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 you can feed off that. Like the, the bus trips into Croker for championship matches, like, there's no nothing will replace uh, the feeling of that and and uh, 
the pride and enjoyment you get from playing for your county. But I suppose on a more personal level, the enjoyment uh, and uh, the football and, and the crack that you have and camaraderie you have around the, around the club scene w- was brilliant last year. It was totally alien to me because since... I was 18. I had been kind of in and out of, of the county setup, so I didn't really have a full year of training, league matches, championship matches, trips away, stag parties, weekends away with the lads. You know, that was that was something that I quite enjoyed. And, and with that, then we had a quite successful year with the club and I was enjoying playing football with the club more than ever. So it, it, when you when you give up the the commitment levels with the with the county you kind of just replace it with something else and and for me that was going back to the club and and throwing in as much effort and commitment behind the team last year as I could so yeah but probably just the 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 enjoyment and the the pride that you get from from running out for the county you know that'll never be replaced yeah, there was huge blowback to the comments that you made in terms of, I, th- I think in some respects you call it as it is, you see players walking away from county panels all over the country in the sense that why would you commit so much um, when essentially it does feel like you can't particularly go anywhere. Did you get a lot of abuse or blowback for your comments personally? No, not not too much. There was, it was surprising quite a number of, of uh, other county lads that I would have maybe played with prior to to uh to the article coming out kind of contacted me and said yeah you know you've made an awful lot of sense in what you're saying but at the same time they were playing with teams in division one of the football and there were teams that were competing for their their provincial titles and that there were lads that were you know could realistically see themselves challenging at the latter end of the championship you know but there was a lot of a lot of what i said resonated with them and you know, a lot of lads who maybe gave the, the county set up a year, one year, had come back to me then and said, you know, what you said was completely how I felt. And that's the reason why I walked away. Again, like it, it was only my honest opinion. It wasn't the right opinion. It wasn't the wrong opinion. It was my opinion. And you, you'll never keep everybody happy. And diehard Mead fans would have picked it up and, and would have had an opinion on what I said. But at the end of the day, it was it was just something that I felt. And I said at the time, and you know, it was my my gut feeling, and I'd stand over it. Because mm, over the years, you've been a very good goalkeeper. You were picked on the international rules team in the past as well. I'm wondering, is there anything that would make you want to go back? And you know, obviously, a manager would have to pick you too. But is there anything that would make you want to go back? Because even a tiered competition, based on league standings at the moment, Mead would be in the top tier anyway, and therefore the chances of winning wouldn't be massively increased. I'd say from a progression kind of angle on it, I think it, the the goalkeeper that they have now in is a is a lot younger. You know, he's in he's twenty twenty five twenty six. So to build um, to build a, a back line around him and build a team around him is probably what the the manager this year has to do, and the manager coming in will have to do, and then in turn finding a younger replacement to him to to bring into the setup as well. I don't think that there'd be much um, to gain from bringing back lads who have who have stepped away from the panel. I think it's it's about um, progressing with the team that they have and building around the young uh, talent that has been brought in this year, which is uh, it's 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 promising and it's pleasing to see that some of the names that are on the team sheet this year. What about if the mark came in, Paddy, and uh, it was set for championship and um, you reignited your role out, out the pitch? Because you're obviously playing it with screen. Like you're, you're, you're playing it all the time with screen. You're out the field, wing forward or full yeah. forward, you know? I'll just stick me in, yeah. Stick you in, exactly. <laughs> well, actually, one of the questions I had for you, right, is um, I would have sat in Croker th- those years from 2012, 2015, 16, and, you know, early enough in 2012, there wasn't that much of a difference with Dublin. Like, there, was, there were games where we lost by six or, you know, with 10 minutes to go, 15 minutes to go, there was instance when you thought, geez, if, if that went Meade's way, that little break went Meade's way, we were right with Dublin. Um, and then, obviously, the, the chasm came and, the di- and like, the... the the quality, just the, the difference became so stark. Um, and I think there was a lot of frustration in the county uh, towards the county team. I, I don't know if you felt that for a couple of years. But this year, I think with the amount of youth that's in there, um, you know yourself, I know Derek Campion's a, a club mate of yours and he scored a couple of great points at the weekend. But there's a lot of young lads in there at the minute. Um, have you noticed there's much of a difference towards attitudes towards the team? I think... Uh 
maybe the supporters are beginning to, to understand where we are as a county and what uh, the challenges that are are been faced by by the current management. I think they they're they're weighing in behind the setup and they're you know we're not been we're not been heavily uh, put under pressure that we have to you know deliver titles or that it's we're still in a bit of a re- rebuilding stage you know we haven't completely got a set 10 or 11 lads that will start week in week out you know we, we've constantly been shuffling the decks but i think we, from the, the the best of the underage lads that have come through in the last couple of years i think they're involved in the setup at the moment which is quite pleasing and they're being blooded and they're standing up and been counted you know you, you mentioned dara campion from screen you know, you've eaten Divine from Nafina. You've Ronan Ryan after coming in from Summer Hill. Um, you know, you'd, you'd like to, to see just maybe a few more. Like you, you've James Conlon from St. Column Kills. Obviously, Ben Brennan last year stepped up from the Mead yeah. Juniors onto the senior team. And so these are all in their 20s as well. They're not kids. These, these are boys are all, yeah. 21, 22, 23. Yeah, well, um, Dara Campion and Eaton Divine would have been on the Mead under 20s last year. So yeah, they, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's where they are. So it, it's nice to see lads like that coming in and, and making the step up and uh, you know holding their own. Like I think in the last three games, Dara has clipped in around six or seven points from play. So you know if he, he can constantly do that for for the rest of the league, you know it'll be something to, to aim towards. You know, and it, it gives it another attack and dimension. You know, if you look at the team sheet. For whatever reasons, he's holding Graham Riley out of the wing forward position, and, and that, and it, it just means that we're not overly burdening the scoring on on Mickey Newman up front. That if a few lads around the the half forward line can clip in with points from play, it will it will help us towards maybe shooting for a promotion place. And Mead have Armagh this weekend. Look at recover from that loss to Donegal, and we're well ahead. And then a mistake from Andrew Colgan has helped Donegal to come back and win that game. Uh, the next thing I want to look at is is just one of the rules that I think could completely change the face of Gaelic football. Obviously, plenty have been trialled at the moment. We had the three hand pass limit there for a while as well. But what about banning the back pass in football? And I mean the back pass to the goalkeeper during play. Um, grassroots GA at Stephen O'Mara that's, he's the first person I saw write about it in November of last year and he was talking about how World Cup 90 in, in soccer was absolutely terribly boring and I do remember it and in 1992 the back pass rule was introduced now the, what I would see as the plus side of it is that you can't just have that release valve of every time a team presses up a uh, defender gives it back to the goalkeeper it's, it's piggy in the middle over his head and you play back out so teams are disincentivized mm. to press up all of a sudden, if you could press up, then that would mean that goalkeepers are probably going to have to go along because they can't do a short one-two kick out. Is this something that you think would work? Oh, one hundred percent. I think it's a. I think it's a great shout. Well, I certainly think it's one that could be trialed, and you know, even getting to the process of being trialed is a difficulty in GA as we've seen with the, the hand pass rule. What I think is you're banging. Uh, you're, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. They were what you said. But what I think would also happen is the sort of image that it will create for the team without the ball. So if there's a, a defender with the ball and he's got another man beside him and he's got the goalkeeper behind him, there's two live options at the moment. Does that uh, disincentivize the opposition team from then pushing up on that player because they've got two options? I think it probably does, where suddenly if you, if you squeeze out one other defensive passing option, then perhaps pressing would become more prevalent. Maybe teams would be more eager to get the ball back and maybe it would lead to more turnovers in that position of the pitch. I'd be very interested to see it and the, the, the picture it paints because I think currently, and I think we might get to it with, with carry a little bit later on is when it comes to the offensive mark the sweeper now has a second role it's not just sweeping it is also the illusion it creates there's a second man in there you're a little bit reluctant to actually kick the ball in because you see there's an an extra fella sitting back down there I think that was the the situation with Calvin they saw Paul Murphy sitting back there last week so I think the same thing would happen if a defender wasn't allowed to pass back to the goalkeeper Uh, again it is just a sense of illusion but I think you reduce one more defensive option in your own half I think it could make a a big difference so you're saying the goalkeeper's not allowed to go to the field is that what you're saying well no I mean you could have a little tweak that if the goalkeeper receives possession outside the 45 fair enough but the idea of passing the ball over and back at the back knowing that you can press up and it's unlikely you're going to get on the yeah, uh, win that turn that ball over that just uh, um, encourages uh, other teams to sit back I do see the merits in it right but when you brought it up earlier on I was, I was asking myself how, mo- how often do you see this right you, you see it with Dublin maybe killing a game they might bring in you know clucks and every so often you've heard about Fermanagh there um, in the Mechanic Cup going backwards to the keeper a lot um, I'm not sure of all the problems in Gaelic games that 
banning a back pass to the goalkeeper is up there. But anything that encourages a, a high press up the field means that there's yeah. going to be more space oh, down definitely. the back, which means the ball is going to be kicked more direct, which definitely. means more but contests. If you can just do piggy in the middle at the back and just wait for a gap, that just creates a really slow, boring game. Okay, yeah, no, I know, I, I do see the merit in it, but I'm just like, I, I would rather us get the mark right and figure out a way of making the hand pass rule work. Because I think that some sort of a tweak is needed on the hand pass rule. I completely agree that. You know, the three hand passes that was, you know, trialed, not properly, but just about wasn't right. I think there's something that has to be done in the hand pass. I don't think it can be completely phased out. But like the back pass to the goalkeeper, you know, uh, maybe maybe Paddy has a better opinion. It's on so it easy to police as well. Paddy, for you as well, like you're a goalkeeper, you might do a short kick out, one, two, and then you can just hold on to possession and wait for an option. Whereas if you were forced, like that'll more or less be taken in a w- away, and you'll have to go along for most kickouts, and that will create more contests. Do you see the merit of it? Yeah, I, I, I see pros and cons, but you know you, you got to be realistic as well. Lads are lads are putting in the hours and hours of training, you know, to achieve, to to win, to to maximise their chances of coming home at the end of the year with a trophy. They don't really mind what the spectators are seeing or how they're feeling. They just want to win and. You know, possession is nine tenths of the law in football. So, yeah, I don't see I don't see how going backwards to the goalie is going to. You know, I I know what you say. It, it'll cut down. Teams will press up the field, but you know, it's it, it's the way the modern game has gone. That you know, you need to have an option across the back. I, I seen Dublin were the best example of it so far this year against Monaghan. John Small went went off with a black card. Um, Niall Scully picked up the ball in, in about the left corner back position and kind of stood on the spot and took a solo, put his hand in the air to kind of signal, right, we're holding on to the ball. And then all the, the Dublin players kind of came towards him and they played kind of piggy in the middle with Monaghan. Even though they were down to 14 men, they yeah. played piggy in the middle and held on to the ball for two and a half minutes. They did use Evan Comerford quite a lot in that passage of play, but it was just to get their man back on the pitch without conceding. You know, Monaghan had an extra man, but they still didn't push up. You know, I don't think teams will change the way they're going to set up or the way they're going to play. I think their mentality is affected by that, though, as well, because I think it's creating a deterrent, like you're saying, Owen, that if you knew we're going to push up here and it means that they've one less option at the back, I think you're far less likely. Now, the counter to that is probably one of the more interesting things in Gaelic football at the moment is the evolution of goalkeepers. Like, even look at Niall Morgan scoring from play the other day, an incredible score. You even think uh, Graham Brody and the fact that he makes all these frays upfield. Sure, Shane Kern's been in a long time, Shane. Shane Curran is doing it a long he time. Was the yeah, he did his hamstring doing it once. <laughs> Manus Brannock uh, created that viral moment when he was soloing out for Anspidale and the yeah. opposition turned him over and got the score. So I do see that the goalkeeping, like, it's very exciting from that point of view. I don't, I don't think but, it's happening that much, though. I, know, I don't the think it's happening is, enough. The reason, the reason that Hurling is more exciting at the moment is because there is no such thing as dilly dallying and holding on to the ball forever. You have yeah, to get rid of it. It's a bit more con- mindless. You just hit it. Yeah, but you do have to. Co- it does create contests all over the field. Is that yeah. Paddy Stiggering in my ear there like, as well? But think about it, right? So I know how frustrating it is. And, I, you know, the way Dublin have killed games. In my mind at the minute, I, I, I don't know if you were playing Paddy in a game, but there was a game against me a couple of years ago. It was a, a Leinster semi final. And the atmosphere in the stadium, I think Kildare played Westmead the same day and it was, both games were bad. But there was 15 minutes to go and Dublin just passed it across. I can just see James McCarthy running back and forth across midfield. He wasn't necessarily bringing the keeper into play, Shane. I don't think that that is ultimately what's going to fix the problems in GEA. Like, if Dublin are if winning by eight points, if Dublin, up, are, if Dublin are winning by eight points in the game, mm. they're within the rights to keep the ball. What are they going to do? Push up and a team is sitting back and is going to suck them in and break them and break on the field? Like, Dublin have to play out the field and draw them out. I, like, I just don't think that the goalkeeper, to me, is not that big a factor. It really isn't. I don't know. I think getting the rewards pressing up means it's going to be more exciting and create more contests. But uh, obviously we're not going to sort that one today and maybe online people will let us know what they think uh, with hashtag OT, um, OTB Gaelic Football. Yeah, something like that anyway. But, uh, Always good to make it up in the yeah, blog. Yeah, <laughs> that's just on social media there, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, whatever way you have it. Um, we'll move on next to Dublin. There's something specific I want to look at in Dublin and it's whether... Cormac Costello, should he start for Dublin this summer? We've seen him over the years, the All-Ireland final, he came on against Mayo a couple of years ago. He came on, got three points from play, if I remember correctly. Absolutely fantastic. Now, he, he missed a couple of chances early on against Galway at the weekend, but he ended up with six points, including one free and one mark score as well. Billy Joe Padden made the point that we've seen flashes of brilliance from him, but not consistency. 
But if he was given more starts, maybe we'd see that consistency. Is he good enough? Is he now in the top six forwards in Dublin? I think so. I think there's I think there's no question he's in the top six forwards in Dublin. But that is a very different question. To, should he be in the starting six forwards for Dublin? I does think. he hand pass the ball around backwards enough? Is what you're <laughs> well, asking. Exactly. I don't think he does. Does he kick the ball from range too much? I think we saw it on Saturday night. Yeah. He does. And he's putting a lot of them over the he's bar. He's such but an exciting footballer to watch. He's he, such an he exciting is. footballer to watch. He really, like, he's direct. But Moyles was making the point on, uh, on AM on Monday that he's never seen uh, a regularised series of Dublin efforts from outside the D as he did last Saturday night. And that may play into the, the strengths of, of Cormac Costello, or maybe it is them just trying something different. If you take the case of Paul Mannion, right? Uh, a couple of years ago, you looked at him as a flair player, a brilliant left foot, really, really fast. You might have targeted him as being maybe a little, a little bit flaky, but like he's completely transformed. And in the last 18 months, he's been one of Gavin's best forwards. And when he's not playing for Dublin, it's a different story. There's no reason why Costello like, can't you know, have a similar sort of a impact. Like, you have to imagine, that lad is edging to just make as big an impact as possible any time he gets a chance. Because like he's good enough. He's proven in all Ireland finals. He's just not given a, a consistent run. For me, like I think the, the full forward line, as I mentioned at the top, is uh, O'Callaghan, Mannion, Rock. I think it's going to be very hard to get away from that, especially uh, when summer comes along. Kieran Kilkenny obviously has centre half forward nailed down. It then depends where you play Brian Howard. I suspect he'll wear number ten, which leaves only one forward position available. Mm. For me, that's Cormac Costello's shirt. In reality, Scully. it's probably going to be Niall Scully's shirt. It's going to be Scully. It, it is. Going to be it Scully. is. And Cormac Costello will go but back Costello, to being a, a what, bench a, what an option though. Like he always uses McMinnon. What an option Costello is off the bench. Like is the problem. The problem with Costello that he plays like an individual, a bit like Dear McConnelly as well, so, and we've seen how his relevance has kind of shrunk with Dublin the last year, so they've won all Ireland without him now, that he's not just a cog in the wheel, he won't just recycle the ball and he'll, he will have a pot from anywhere. Paddy, what do you think? Yeah, look, there's no question that the Cormac Costello, he, he's, he's a quality forward and he, he'd definitely be in 31 other counties, he'd be starting, he'd be a, a mainstay on, on the team, but there's obviously something else behind it, um, whether he's not fitting into the way Jim Gavin wants to go or is he not doing it on a consistent basis behind closed doors and training or is he not, you know, there, if he was doing what, what he needed to do week in, week out, we'd be seeing him week in, week out on the pitch, you know. So I don't know, he's been around probably since 2013, 14, kind of in and out like that and I suppose now he's he's fitting into the old... Kevin McManaman kind of tagged that he he's a super sober he's he's going to be an impact sub and maybe that that's maybe that suits him maybe maybe that's just the way that the management see that they want to finish with maybe they want to finish with their best six on the, on the pitch at the end of the game in championship football and then the the first maybe 40 minutes is all about just grinding a team down to leave gaps for him to come on and clip four or five points from play I wonder how many counties um, where he'd be the, the top forward. I mean, maybe not, in, obviously not in Dublin, the way things have gone. Probably not in Kerry. I'm, I'm sure you're going to fight that one hard on. Um, I'm going to say maybe not in Tipperary as well because of Michael Quinlevin. Ross Common uh, to take him. Ross, Ross Common would take him ahead that's of Conor Cox. He, maybe. That's, that's only a little dig. How, how many counties would he be the, the top forward? He wouldn't be in Monaghan. And he wouldn't. He wouldn't start for Monaghan. No, sorry, he wouldn't be the best forward. The very sorry. best forward. Conor McMahon is fair enough. <laughs> sorry, uh, he would definitely start for Monaghan. He wouldn't be the best forward there. Yeah, what about uh, Galway? Daniel uh, Comer, Shane Walsh, um, Ian Burke. Like I, I, think, Ian Burke, Burke, I yeah. think we're giving Galway forwards benefit of the doubt in that one. So I think I think you're getting into like the the bottom two in the Super Eights last year, uh, and maybe Tyrone. So you'd be uh, Tyrone's best forward. I, I think so. But sorry, Paddy's point on uh, the McMinniman role, like. Mm. Gee, like 15 minutes to go and you've kept Dublin to a couple of scores and Costello comes in. Like, the difference that he made in that All-Ireland final against Mayo, you just can't underestimate what that does in like the Dublin management psyche. They're like, why, why would they start Costello? Bring him off the bench. Yeah. If you can somehow keep him motivated, which I'm sure they will because he's, he obviously is mad to start if he gets a chance, but like, Keep him in the mix, and then he's in, and he's such an impact sub. I, I think the McManaman comparison is far more accurate than the Dear McConnelly comparison. I don't think there is an individuality complex around Cormac Costello that is sort of dissuading Jim Gavin and that his face doesn't fit. Or the fact that, that he'll, he'll, he'll have a pop from anywhere, every other scorer will follow the process. Well, I, I think Cormac Costello can follow the process as well. When he came on off the bench... That, I agree. In, in that but then why isn't he starting? Process. If he can follow the process, why isn't he starting? Because he's a better impact sub. 
I go away. He's a better impact sub. I, I do think so. And, and Khan would be a good impact sub as well. When you're as good as Dublin, sorry, who? Khan. Khan O'Callaghan would make well, a fairly good impact sub too. And I'm not saying you should start ahead of him, my own club mate. But well, then there you go. So Costello's behind Khan. Have I talked myself around the band here? Have I? I but so, yeah. Also, you've got to think about the, the sort of roles that each man has to play. And maybe it is just simply Costello versus Conor Callaghan. You can't have both of them on the pitch because Howard and Niall Scully are just too bloody important. And of course, Gary Kilkenny, that half forward line is too important to the way Dublin play and to the way they structure attacks that Cormac Costello just isn't in that mould. But you do have one room for one luxury forward. Mm. Mm. And at the moment, that's Conor Callaghan. And at the times, last year, he was a luxury. Like, it wasn't, he, was, he wasn't as good as he Lance was the previous the year. highest order. He wasn't as good as he was the previous year. That's a fact. But that's Why because that they, because they play in a very, very different way. Dublin, previous years, quick on the transition. They win mm. the ball. He's given it quickly. He bursts up the field. He destroys you. Last year, they slowly bring the ball up the field. Yeah. So he's always playing in much tighter confines. So I think it's, it's very different. But that's and my point exactly. I'm not saying he's become a bad footballer. I'm saying that as, uh, as his role, uh, compared to the previous year, I guarantee he's still doing precisely diminished. what he's been told. And oh, I'm sure he has. The, the thing sure is, he has. Costello is probably going to start every single league game for Dublin this year. He's probably going to shoot the lights out, and then come Championship, he's not going to be. He's going to be impacts up. Okay. Okay. Start against Galway. Quick word on Johnny Cooper. Or Costello or Callahan. I'm talking about Costello. Sorry, yes. Quick word on Johnny Cooper at the weekend. He wore the number six shirt. Probably filled in the Keno Sullivan role. I know both Dublin and Galway weren't at full strength, but the fact that he was able to slot right in at the sweeper role and it was business as usual without Keno Sullivan. Does that just show that yet another key man for Dublin can just be easily replaced because their strength and depth is just so so vast? I think the way Galway play meant that Cooper was never really going to be in trouble in that role. I think that if... Uh, so you saw what Monaghan did, uh, the damage they did, the way they played McManus and O'Hanlon in those 15-20 minutes in the second half. Mm. Like, Galway actually, I think, have the personnel to play a game like that. I know Comer, Comer wasn't playing, but like they've got... Ian Burke and Shane Walsh who can spray passes as well as Jack McCarran or, or you know whoever from Monaghan but Burke and Walsh play completely different roles for Galway um, the way Galway play football like they, they, I just don't think that Cooper Cooper's hands would have been tied as, as much as it would have been against a different, a different team playing a different way also I think Tom Flynn in a full forward helps a sweeper when you can actually see a big full back behind you and you're like that's where they're putting the ball yeah. being a sweeper in that position is so easy yeah it's well, predictable. It's, sorry, not it's so predictable. It's not. Well, in comparison to being a, a sweeper against, say, Pete Mayo in, in 16 or 17, when you, when you don't know if they're going to go down the side to Andy Moore and you don't know if you're going to work through the channels, you don't know if Lee Keegan's going to be coming off his shoulder. There's just so many variables as to how they attack. Whereas with Galway on Saturday, and I, I'm sure it was just like experimentation around the league, they wanted to try r- r- yeah. one into Tom Flynn, and it's, it's a fairly easy sweeper role mm. sitting in front of that. We're going to talk a little bit of Mayo now, and just to lead us into the topic, Anthony Miles was on Off the Ball AM earlier in the week talking about the role of Aidan O'Shea this year. There always would be question marks about Aidan O'Shea at 11. You were impressed with him though at centre forward yesterday. Yeah, I was. I thought, I thought he, he, he changed it up. Like if I was setting up for O'Shea, you're saying, OK, you know, he's going to get the ball in and around midfield. He's going to turn, he's going to try to run at you. So what we need to do is we need to, physically he'll just blow you out of the way. So what we need to do is we need to ch- close the channel in on him. So we need to kind of nearly run with him and put him into an area where he doesn't want to be. In other words, that we're not giving him handy freeze, we're not dragging out of him, we're not allowing him to lay off the ball easy, we're just kind of nearly frustrating him and, and causing him to get kind of a bit muddled. Um, yesterday he was really smart in how he distributed the ball. Like, I mean, he got his head up an awful lot. Very, His first option wasn't just to bury his head and go. You know, he got the head up the first time, he sprayed balls, he just laid little hand passes. He was nearly a decoy for an awful lot of stuff. So physically taking two or three guys and then just slipping the ball to runners, which was the way that he should be played. Mm. Because he is so physical that most teams would try to double up on him there. Um, you know, you'll say to a midfielder, listen, keep an eye on him and try and get back in to help the six, try and double up on him. And if, but if he's able to take that and, and slip it off to a, 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 a good mobile middle fielder, which they have in O'Connor, yeah. well, then that causes issues for you. And that half back line, almost like a number nine in soccer dropping deep to be the, the hold up man. Like, is, is that the sort of role that we're talking here for Aiden O'Shea? Or yeah, it's... like, I mean, I, you know, I, th- I think he, I, no, like, he, he can still deliver a pass, okay. you know, and he can deliver a really good pass. Um, but what has happened to him a lot is, due to his size and I think his physicality and the amount of punishment he takes when he runs with the ball, he was going in and out of games an awful lot. You know, people say, oh, sure, he goes missing for five or ten minutes. But that was the nature of, of him as a player. I think if he's able to mix it up much more with actually 
nearly not standing in the pocket, but actually being, as I say, a foil for fellas. Slipping hand passes to guys when he feels the, the tackle's coming in, or actually delivering passes, it'll actually make his running then, uh, when he sees the opportunity, a lot more effective. Yeah, may have started very brightly under James Horn and his second coming. One of the like, so that's that's where Aidan O'Shea has been used at the moment. One thing that I think is very interesting is where are they going to use Keith Higgins this year because they know they've got versatility with him. He was playing in the full back line the other day, came up, scored a wonderful goal. I just basically I watched the game on TV and my observation was that he was marking Darren McCurry at times. Occasionally he seemed to be the spare man as well. But in the past he played in centre forward as well and we know how good he is. So Paddy, where do you think Mayo would best be able to utilise Keith Higgins? He is 33 years of age. Do you want to be zapping his legs running after a young corner forward from side to side or get him on the ball? I'd I'd be more worried if I was playing against Mayo and, and he, he popped up up the field, you know, in the forward line. I think he, he's uh he's proven down through the years how adaptable he is as a player, how natural he is on the ball. You know, he he's he's clever enough, he can take a score, he can kick a point, he kicked a great goal at the weekend. You know, I I'd be more worried setting up defensively against him if Mayo could maybe add a little bit more um free scoring players to, to their forward line, you know, they They've kind of been over reliant over the last couple of years. So, if, any way at all to, to keep the scoreboard ticking up front, and I think he he might be an option there just to kind of sweep between midfield and half forward and get in on get in maybe two or three points from play. The question then is, do they have enough guys at the back who can cover for him? So I was going through the names. So uh, O'Donoghue, Chris Barrett, Brendan Harrison, Paddy Durkin, Colin Boyle, Lee Keegan. You could even play Donny Vaughan at the back as well if you want to. So they're not left short back there if they do move him up the field. Oh yeah, they, they have plenty of cover at the back as well. I think it, you'll see that throughout the rest of the league. James Horn will. He'll experiment but I think it, as well, I think that they're going to focus heavily in on the league and, and try and go all out to win. You know, they'll want to play Dublin as early as possible in uh, in the season for a major honour. And if if uh, if it comes to it, I wouldn't be very surprised to see Mayo and Dublin in a league final. I think that's the route that uh, it looks that James Horn is trying to set up. I'm going to bring the guys in in a second, but just one final question for you, Paddy, on this particular topic. Last year, Keith Higgins played hurling for the league for Mayo and then came back and played football as well. This year, James Horn is back and he's playing football throughout the league as well. Now, you're in a county that had the likes of Mickey Burke who was jumping between the hurling and football as well. Do you see anything in that, the fact that he's back playing football only from the start of the year this time? I think it's it's very difficult for for lads to try and dual play at the moment. We, we had, Mickey Burke did it for years with James Toher then two years ago trying it as well and just the the hassle for the player themselves to try and you know fulfill training for two managers serve and two masters you know if especially if the managers work well together and are, and are talking regularly yes it, it may work but you know the commitment levels for for both teams is so high nowadays that it just physically is impossible on the body you know if you're playing a league match on a sunday and then you have to train you're going to be asked to train at least three times then during the week, twice with one, one with the other. There's going to be strength and condition, there's going to be recovery sessions in the middle there. So you basically, every day of the week will be taken up and hurling isn't a sport that you can just rock in, pick up a hurley and go out and, and be the best player on the pitch. You have to obviously do an awful lot of individual work in in the wall balls and, and that sort of stuff. So I think this year it's a sign of an, an intent from, from Mayo and from Higgins and from Horan that they're focusing in maybe to get their hands on on, uh, on national honours early in the year and then focus in on, on one big ambush maybe on the championship later on in the year. Mm. Mayo have averaged about fourth or fifth position in the league since James Horan first took over in 2011. Um, number one, are they going to try and win the league this year? Number two, what part of the field would you like to see Higgins in if you were a Mayo fan? Because their ability to carry the ball at teams at pace with a change of direction is probably why they were so competitive with Dublin over the last number of years. I don't think there's any question that Keith Higgins is a better halfback than he is in the fullback line. But the question is, are Mayo better served with him there? Because I think, you look at the halfback line, it's Keegan Boyle Durkin. And it's hard to find a way for Keith Higgins to get in ahead of any of them because I think then, if you get into your full back line, 
is Keith Higgins in your best three players in the full back line? And I think, yes, he absolutely is. If you put him in one corner, Owen O'Donoghue in the other corner, then the, the question mark with, with Mayo is full back as it has been, I think, for a little while. You've got options there. Harrison, Barrett, you've got Vaughan as a potential option there. And if you go with Vaughan there, then maybe you've got Stephen Cohen as, a, as an option in midfield, mm. who perhaps hasn't made himself, uh, hasn't shown himself to be ready to play midfield in a big championship game just yet. I think it's going to be a big year for him though. So I think that the answer there is Harrison or Barrett a fullback, Keith Higgins one side of him as a cornerback and, and I think that's the way they go. And Cohen man marks Peter Hart the other day when Hart was going in and out yeah. as well so they see him as an option back I, there. I think Higgins is such a luxury and so it's actually such a blessing to be able to name a man like that in cornerback because like he can do the job cornerback. He can man mark and he's, he's fast enough. And as Paddy mentioned, he's a very adaptable player. I just think with that man, it's horse for courses. Like, who is he going to be man marking inside? And if it's, if it's the case that they're playing a team, say it's Galway and Shane Walsh is dropping out the pitch, leave Higgins on him. And Higgins will do damage himself following him out the field. He can play anywhere in the, on the pitch. Do you know what I mean? Like, how natural but he at took 33 that 33 your legs going to be killed early well, marking someone like Shane Walsh. Well, yeah, that's it. You've you got to kind of you got to kind of adapt then and, and move him around. But the thing is, he can play anywhere. He can play inside or he can play out the field. I think he's a luxury to have. And if he can keep going for one more season, I like personally, I think Mayor are going to be fantastic mm. to watch this year. Mayor like, flying. And like, they have Cavan this weekend. You expect him to win. Some of those new players as well look good. The likes of yeah, like Fionn McDonough. It's, it's not even flying. It's the fact that McDonough is making an impact. It's mm. the fact that mm. Brian Reap, who kind of stood out at DCU and fresher level and under twenty le- under under twenty level, is actually scoring quality goals. Like mentioned by Paddy Minigo, free scoring forwards. Like I don't know if McDonough will post one three every week, but he's shown that he can kick ball. Mm. You know they've got Loftus to come back. They've got McLaughlin to come back. O'Connor to come back, and they've actually got uh, you know a lot of good under twenty players coming through, like Michael Plunkett last year, and I think they're. They're freshened up, like June 30th. They're out June 30th last year. Yeah. It's Pat, I'm sorry, I was just going to ask Paddy, do you think Mayo are the most likely to dethrone Dublin if anyone's going to do it? Um, they, they, sneakily, yeah, they, they could be, I wouldn't say dark horses because they're thrown into the mix every year, but I think they're they're looking rejuvenated under James Horn so far. and I think it's it's a sign of, of him in as a manager that there, there's a belief back in the squad. You, you <coughs> see Aidan O'Shea starting the first round of the league and you know, I think as the the year goes on, they're only going to strengthen, as you mentioned, with, with the players to come back in for the rest of this league. They've a very winnable match in. I think it's down in Mayo this weekend. They've Cavan, so you know they could be six six points from six after three games, and you know after that, then you're going to be easing Killian O'Connor back into the team. You know, Kevin McLaughlin back into the team. Like it's it's only going to go one way for Mayo. So be quite excited to see. I'd say they'll they'll. Uh, they could retain Connacht anyway, definitely, and and I, I, I wouldn't underestimate them to come up against Dublin again this year in a ding dong. In the match. Super Eights, that'd be nice. Mayo and Dublin in Super yeah. Eights. We take that, Paddy. I know you're on lunchtime there. You probably haven't had a chance to eat yet, so we'll say goodbye to you there. And thanks very much. No worries. Thanks, lads. Cheers, Paddy. Great to have Paddy on there. Um, Owen, so do you think that they're more likely to? Uh, to catch Dublin because Kerry sure aren't gonna. <laughs> well, you know, um, let, let's let's go pure, pure kind of cute hoor here and say yara yara yara. Uh, even if you kind of leave that to the side, my jibe. You have a wild card, don't you? <laughs> what do you mean I've got a wild card? Of who you reckon will push Dublin this year? Do I? Donny Gall. Oh, Donny Gall. No, I, 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 I have been talking of Donny Gall, but to the point of them actually. Uh, outperforming last season, I think. I think they underperformed last what year. What about Monaghan? Know. People are talking about that. Give Monaghan a real chance now. Beating them in the league is one thing. They did it last year as well. I Which would have last year in the All Ireland final. I would have given Monaghan a, bit, a better chance in an All Ireland final against Dublin than I would have given Tyrone a goal. Like, just the way that they are. I, I, I just think that there is there's, there's two different uh, graphs here. Like, there's a graph of how good a team is and yeah. how consistently they perform over the course of the league. And Monaghan are one of those teams, and they can beat. Anyone under day, blah, 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 cliche. But when it actually comes to an All-Ireland final, or in Monaghan's case, an All-Ireland semi-final, and you're up against Dublin, who, are you, who have you got your money on? And if your money is going anywhere other than Kerry or Mayo, I, I, think you're, I, I just think you're stupid. Wait, I, no. I just, I just don't think any team other than Kerry, Kerry or Mayo somehow the got a draw against Monaghan last year yep. in the Super 8. Yep. And you're telling me After I'd be mad. After a massive underperformance. Like the, you know that's your than, level now. What? That, perhaps that's your level now. Well, what's the level? Monaghan beat you in the league as well. Just a consistent uh, quarter-final stage. Uh, I'd respectfully disagree with that, and uh, I, I do think. I'm not here for your respect. <laughs> no, and I'm, I'm not here I'm to not, be disproved. And I'm not here to give you my respect either. <laughs> I'm here to tell you the fact of the matter is there's only two counties who've really given Dublin a bit of a heart attack in this four in a row, and they are Kerry and Mayo. And Mayo, 
for, because of that, for me, are the, the number one team outside of Dublin in the country. The, the team most likely to win Sam Maguire if it's not Dublin, because ultimately that is the aim of the game. Yes. That mm. is the aim of the, like, y- We have to judge a team. If we're ranking teams right now, it has to be based on how do they compare to Dublin. And compare to Dublin in terms of how they play, in terms of their specific threats, and in terms of the know-how that they have on the sideline and on the pitch, Mayo are the number one contender to seal that throne. And because of the, uh, the reasons I've just outlined, Kerry are number two in that uh, sphere of being able to take down Dublin. Now, I, I do think Mayo still have all their parts in order from two years ago. The question is, how quickly do they come back? They haven't yeah. had any retirees from 2017. The big question for me is midfield. But I've, I've, I've got no worries about Dermot O'Connor, who I think could be in with an all-star year. Uh, and I know that we, we all kind of have the, the cute image of him almost dying in Newbridge last year. Got and tired were, watching him. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's just going to be a, a kind of a sign of things to come this year for them. So, so I'm a little bit worried about midfield because of the injuries, the, the injury to Tom Parsons, and I don't think Shemi O'Shea will come back to that level. That it could be a completely new midfield of Vaughan and Dermot O'Connor. And the big question, and I, I was very encouraged with his performance at the weekend, was Andy Moran. And you look at Keith Higgins as well, mm. still flying. Obviously, Lee Keegan's still going to be flying. Is, is Colin Boyle going to get to that level? They're the three Higgins, Boyle, and Andy Moran. If the three of them get back to 2017 level, Mayo can win the All Ireland. Right, let's get on to the tactics as well. You've, you've been at Kerry's two games this year yeah. and uh, just tell us how they're setting up and how it's different to maybe what was done under Eamon Fitzmaurice. Do we have, so we don't have a, a goalkeeper marker which you don't we, obviously need. We don't, well, we, you can use the blue one for now. Um, I might just set up here on, uh, on my side here. We, Take so, that over there. It's just kind of important just to point out the goalkeeper first of all that it's uh, Shane Ryan who stepped into goals for Kerry this year. There's no guarantee that once Shane Murphy finishes up with Dr. Crokes he's automatically going to go back into goals because this guy is very, very good. There was some talk about a little bit of conflict that uh, he didn't actually play for Kerry over the last couple of years that he, he was perhaps asked to play uh, goalkeeper for his club uh, what plays outfield for his club and is brilliant outfield for his club and now that uh, rule may have been relaxed we'll see once the club football comes back in but he's back in uh, with Kerry camp and he's been excellent for the first couple of games although we don't really know until uh, they get a full midfield out uh, exactly how that's going to operate What's this rule you're talking about for those who wouldn't know about it this rule that you're talking about that's, that uh, got in the way for Shane Ryan Well it's not a rule as such it was just a particular preference that Shane Ryan. Sort of the Simon Zebo rule, where it's a, it's it's a Kerry tradition. Explicit rule, but it's it's kind it's of. A, it's a, if, if you're if you want to be goalkeeper for Kerry, you want to be you need to be playing in goals for your okay. club, which I think is a fairly reasonable request in most cases, except in this rather exceptional case. He was taking frees for his club, like he, okay. like he was a brilliant, brilliant forward. But anyway, he, he's goalkeeper there, and he is until Crokes get knocked out at the very least. So the way I'm looking at it now, now granted they've come up against Cavan and Tyrone in the first couple of games. Tyrone terrible on day one, but it seems to me that they're going to certainly play two lads in their full back line, two man. So you've got Peter Crowley as one, and then my own club man Jack Sherwood as the other. He's uh, carries full back for the first two games. They'll pick up men. Uh, it depends who it's going to be at the weekend. Will it be Manning and Rock? Chances are it will be. But interestingly, right in front of them, and I'm just going on the Cavan game now for this one, uh, sat Paul Murphy. And we were chatting about this earlier on, that uh, perhaps the deterrent of the new rule, the offensive mark, makes somebody like Paul Murphy quite effective. Now, there was one occasion when uh, the other day when a Cavan man just kind of came through the middle of uh, Kerry's defence and just shrugged off Paul Murphy and went straight through and I think put the ball over the bar. So, as an actual sweeper, I don't think he's that effective and he's not the future there. But for the duration of the league, just an extra body in there to stop the offensive mark uh, option, I think he's going to sit there and I think... Uh, it's, it's going to happen again at the weekend. Against Tyrone, they swapped that role. So Crowley hopped out to sweeper for a little while. Thomas Sullivan hopped out to sweeper for a little while. But I'm not sure if that was by design. I think it was such slow build-up that Kerry lads could actually see which way Tyrone are going to kick the ball and just hopped in there. So they had a rotating carousel of sweepers. So we'll say Paul Murphy's going to go in there for the time being. Let's go to uh, the three half-backs here. So for me, for what I could see at the moment, we've got Tyg Morley on this wing uh, at right wing back. That's probably the most uh, regimented position we've got so far in the back line. Then you've got the other two half-backs, which is going to be Tom O'Sullivan uh, and Brino Bjogliuk. Now, Bjogliuk out here can drop back to mark a man. Who's he going to pick up if Conor Callaghan starts the weekend? There's a chance that Bjogliuk is going to look after that. He was brilliant going forward the last day, made some crucial interceptions at around the 45, his best game in a Kerry shirt. Uh, the other two, as I say, uh, Tom Sullivan here at centre-back, I expect him, like Dermot O'Connor this year for Mayo, to have a huge year, potential all-star. So that's the way Kerry will set up, uh, I guess, if you, if you look at it on, on a conventional level. We're not going to get into the blanket defence just yet. What really interests me now is the midfield. As I say, we can't judge Shane Ryan until, for me, David Moran starts. I want to see a full 70 minutes with mm. David Moran there and see how Shane Ryan's kickouts are. So at the weekend last week, what they went with was uh, Jack Barry uh, and Adrian Spillane. 
Uh, so uh, then we have Sean O'Shea here uh, at centre forward I want to come back to the midfield in just a while so Sean O'Shea can drop deeper he likes to take the ball up around here and run at the man through the, the centre of the park uh, a sweeper's eye on Sean O'Shea would be a crucial part if Dublin elect to play one this Saturday night mm. which they probably will uh, just to, go, to run through the rest of uh, the midfield then uh, new guy Dermot O'Connor uh, good ball carrier as with uh, Jonathan Lyon another ball carrier another Dermot O'Connor uh, another Dermot O'Connor okay. this, this guy from uh, Niguel he's, a, he's, a, he's an excellent footballer Jonathan Lyon probably more of a back tradition up and wing forward yeah but a ball carrier is key yeah. and uh, what I think will actually happen is one of these lads is going to get dropped for the weekend and Darren Moynihan will start he didn't start against Cavan because they were arresting him after uh, playing Sigerson up in Belfast uh, during the week last week so he's going to come back to the team Darren Moynihan has been brilliant so either Dermot O'Connor or Jonathan Lyon is going to get dropped probably Dermot O'Connor to be quite honest with you for this weekend then we get into the, the three forwards so we've got Paul Ganey last week and, uh, and Killian Spillane who's probably not going to start this weekend either uh, inside and then we've got Stephen O'Brien here yeah so this is where we get into kind of the complicated area of how Kerry are actually setting up. I do think they'll keep the two-man full forward line, even without the ball, at a certain point. So it's the first ma- uh, minute of the match and Dublin have the ball. I expect them to keep two up front here. What happens then is, obviously, the midfield will drop back, and we'll have Sean O'Shea here, who's willing to drop back. But I think these lads will also go back with them. So these will be Dara Moynihan and Jonathan Lyon, and we will have 13 men behind the ball. And that will be their plan A. They turn over the ball, get a score, and then go 13 men behind the ball again, assuming the build-up is quite slow. But if things start to go a little bit wrong for them, then Stephen O'Brien will drop back, which they've already shown. Or if things continue to go against them, well, then the they will go the back. full 15 back uh, at, the, at that point, which is what we've seen for a huge part of the first game against Cavan, the first half against Cavan last week, and for a, a decent selection of the game against Tyrone as well. What I do want to just touch on briefly here is the the substitutes that Kerry made uh, on Saturday because they are extremely telling. So the first one was Darren Moynihan on for Killian Spillane. He's going to start at the weekend. Uh, Tommy Walsh came on for Jonathan Lyons. So if you just want to focus on the attack here, uh, Tommy Walsh came in kind of roaming around here every time Kerry had the ball out to the left wing. Claimed a couple of marks. Uh, well, he claimed one mark and he put it badly wide, but he claimed another a few bouncing balls. Actually, low ball into the chest, activating runners off the shoulder here, which worked a treat for Kerry late on. So Tommy Walsh coming out to the wing worked very well. We had Mark Griffin on for Dermot O'Connor, which was a very interesting really? one. Very, exactly, like formerly full back. Formerly full back. We, my, myself, and my Kerry Mafia comrades who go to all the games. We our personal endeavour is to see Mark Griffin play midfield for really? Kerry because we've seen him. Like yeah, we, yeah, yeah. you've you know, seen him in the big games. Gets the ball. Like Tommy Griffin back. before. Like Tommy Griffin. Exactly. I want to see him out. Like the half back line at the moment for Kerry is, is a quite a strong position with Morley O'Sullivan up the league. So I, I can't see him there, but potentially as a midfielder because, and this is the key part. Peter Keane loves to play a third midfielder in all his teams over the past couple of years. And that made this uh, substitute very, uh, very interesting. And this is a potential name we need to be watching out for. Uh, it is uh, Gavin O'Brien who came on. So there was a, a substitution. Gavin O'Brien came on for Adrian Spillane, like for like a midfield. But then Stephen O'Brien was taken off and David Moran came on for him. So at that point, you're looking at three midfielders uh, in the Kerry team. You had Jack Barry on the pitch, you had David Moran on the pitch, and you had Gavin O'Brien on the pitch. And basically... Like this. One took the right wing, one took the middle, one took the left wing. And this is when Kerry went on their purple patch near the end of the game was against Cavan. Uh, Mark Griffin was kind of hovering in around half back. At this point, the game started to get quite disjointed. There was a black card. Thomas Sullivan was in the sin bin. There was a blood soap. Kerry actually had 16 men on the pitch at one point until the referee actually started to tours. stop. How long was that? And get back. Uh, uh, well, David Moore doesn't come on the pitch until the 69th minute. And but there the was 78 minutes stage. played. Uh, the, the point to go ahead, I think, was 68. Okay. Uh, I, can't, I can't quite recall. I should have a match board in front of me. But that basically tells us what we need to know. The sweeper, I'm not convinced we're going to continue with it. I think it's a bit of uh, an ailment. I, th- I think it's a bit of a medicine against the, the big direct uh, quest for a mark. But the three-man midfield, there, it's going to be like a bit of a giant's causeway. And like this is the big dilemma now. Does he continue to go with uh, wing forwards that are like Jonathan Lyon and Darren Moynihan, who are brilliant runners, turning defence into attack with, with rapid transition? Or does he sacrifice one of them to play a big man like Gavin O'Brien to claim the, to claim the, the kickouts? That's the big question. And the team sheet for Saturday night is going to be very, very telling. That's quite the, the pro carry rant there. I will say, what I do like about it is if, if you have got Killian Spillane and Paul Ganey up front and the rest of the team is pretty defensive, having Sean O'Shea as a, a baller there mm. and having Sean O'Brien's pace or Stephen O'Brien's pace there on the counter, I think is good. But it might be a thing where Kerry are only starting out. Let's see how they go in six months, in a year, in two years, because this is all building towards what they want. Potentially, to but the thing is, like, <laughs> there's been a marked improvement 
in their tackling, a marked improvement in their intensity. It's not like Donny Buckley is a new coach in the Kerry team and he's putting his print on them. Yeah. He's been in there before. It's kind of just like a, a triggering again of some of the things they used to know. Peter Keane's minor teams were brilliant challengers of the ball. It's not just the positioning, it's the ability to actually turn the ball over, which is another thing. So who, well, would, Keane, who would Keane have had while he was minor manager? Would it be Moynihan? Would he have had Gavin O'Brien? Yeah. You've, I've heard you talking about Gavin O'Brien a couple of times now. Well, Ga- Gavin O'Brien was mentioned to me by, by Mike Quirk at, at the Kerry game a couple of weeks ago because he would be his club manager and he really kind of said that this guy's got a very good chance of being involved with Kerry for, for the championship and on his performance last week albeit he came on as a sub I tend to agree with him because he's not only a big fit I think he's could be 6'3", 4'5", but he's also got burning pace to make a good uh, rugby comparison for you Jacob Stockdale kind of springs to mind when you see a fella who's that big and you're Ooh. like how can, how can he move that quickly? <laughs> Flanker uh, on the wing We've got a uh, after this we've got uh, the old debate coming up it's going to be Shane against Shane Oh, Shane, that is. First of all, we've Billy Joe Padden talking to Joe on Off the Ball last night. He's discussing Tyrone after their opening two defeats to Kerry and Mayo. Tyrone will be well conditioned come the summer. They're a physically fit team and they're good athletes and they have 30 fellas of a high level that, that, that are already operating you know, at that level. And maybe, that, maybe that, it's as simple as that. They haven't done a whole lot. Now, there is a lot of talk about them trying to change their approach and be less reactive and, and a more proactive team that can take the game to opponents. Yeah. And maybe they are training that way. And sometimes it's hard to change your tack quickly, particularly when you're put under pressure like they were against Mayo when Mayo made such a good start after the initial 10 minutes and they just weren't able to react. And if you get caught between two stools, you can sometimes see passages of play like you describe where no one really went to put it lay a finger on Keith mm. Higgins as he just waltzed around them and that's something that they will address at time once they get more comfortable to playing a more expansive game plan if that's what they're doing to be honest watching the game I didn't see too much of that expansive football and to be honest what I saw was the missing a fellow like Colm Kavanagh playing that sweeper role to perfection and being in that area where where they can break down attacks and then start attacks of their own. And uh, I suppose the other thing that was a surprise really is that Tyrone really missed it. Peter Hart, one of their better footballers, kicked a lot of balls into the goalkeeper's hands early in the game. And it could have been a different game if they had kicked those because it would have given them confidence and, and maybe wouldn't have allowed Mayo to gain as much confidence from getting that early lead. Uh, right. OK, so we've got a, a new segment here on the Gaelic Football Show. Um Shane Stapleton came up with it. It's called Shane versus Shane, but it's a uh, Shane Stapleton versus Owen Shane. And uh, <laughs> it's great, the topic, <laughs> the topic today, right? I'm going to be the referee. It's my job. I'm going to stay out of it. I'm going to stay impartial for the first couple of minutes. Shane, you're going to get a minute to make your case. Owen, you're going to make. I mean, Shane, you're going to make a minute to get your case. And uh, the topic today is: Should Mickey Hart still be the Tyrone manager? Shane, you're up first. Jesus, I, I don't think Lock so. He has, he has a deal until the end of 2020, but like last year they got to the All-Ireland final, but did they actually contest the All-Ireland? No. They, were on, they started okay, they were on the back foot for the, for the rest of the game. Started this year, they won the McKenna Cup, they've looked terrible since. Two losses from two, they're bottom of Division 1, they're minus 13 score in differential, which is the worst of all four divisions. Mickey Hart said after the game, we have to accept we have a huge amount of work to be doing to be staying at this level of football. You've had the team for 16 or 17 years. How much more time do you need? Um, and I just, I just can't see them being close to beating Dublin this year at all. Again, have they progressed enough? He's bringing back Kyle Coney, who he dropped before. Darren McCurry's back in. Is he going anywhere? Peter Hart was in a full forward a lot. He's one of the best ball carriers around. I know he's in and out. Got ten seconds here. I just don't see where it's going to work for them. And I think maybe fresh blood, fresh ideas. All right. He 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 got his uh, point across there in under a minute. So Owen, you've got the chance to make a case. I need about an hour here to deconstruct all those arguments. I know. First, it's pretty all, weak. First of all, Tyrone lost three of their four first uh, league games last year. So let, let's just forget about the idea of a poor start. And you mentioned they've won the McKenna Cup. You talk about the 16 year thing and what has Mickey Hart actually done? Has he taken gone from a place where he had the second best team of the decade last year to actually coming back and regenerating a second team? And the thing is. They faded into mediocrity for a few years. Like you look at their Ulster win in 2010, after that, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, didn't even make an Ulster final in all of those. After that, back to back Ulster finals. The following year, which was last year, they didn't make the Ulster final, but they made the All Ireland final. You look at their team, are they underachieving? Of course they're not. You know, how many marquee players do they have? Three at a stretch. They've got Matty Donnelly, they've got Colin Kavanagh, they've got Peter Hart. You compare that to the mar- marquee players that other Ulster teams have. You can pick out three from Monaghan, you can pick out three from Donegal. 
you go to Mayo or Kerry, they've got far more than three marquee players. They've all got better teams, if not just as good a team as Tyrone. And they made an All-Ireland final last year. That, for me, is actually overachievement from Tyrone last year. Do I think they're good to watch? No. Do I think they're a good team? No. But do I think Mickey Hart is a great manager? Of course I do. That's the clock. So it doesn't matter that they're not a good team. According to you, your words there, do I think they're a good team? No. And he's had them for years. On an individual basis. He's had every one of these players come through. It's not like they're all 19 and 20 years of age. And still, they don't look any closer to beating Dublin. But the thing is, the, the gauging to run by Dublin at the moment is like gauging me as a hurling player. It's just completely pointless. They're, they're not in the same ballpark. They but don't have the players them. to do so. They, just, they simply do not have a squad good enough to compete with Dublin. The fact that they got to an All-Ireland final last year was a, a, an absolutely... Does he have a, impressive It's a huge players. goal, sir. Front to back, does he have impressive players? Like, Niall Morgan's a little bit erratic, but he's obviously a very good goalkeeper. Park Hampsey's excellent. Tiernan McCann is excellent. Peter Hart, Matty Donnelly... Colm Kavanagh. They have, they have excellent players all over the field. Yeah, they're missing a marquee forward or two, but could he get more out of the likes of Lee Brennan? Could he get more out of Mark Bradley? I mean, surely they could get a little bit closer to Dublin than they did last year, and I just don't see how he's going to bring them on. And there are probably other... Co- I, just, I, think it, I, think it's an I think it's an astonishing take to think that Mickey Hart should lose his job after getting them to an all I'm not final. saying boot him Before that, right won back-to-back Ulster titles. At the moment, they've lost their first two league games of the year after winning the McKenna Cup. They lost three of their four first opening league games last year. But they've kept the team from one week to the next. I just don't think the players are there in Tyrone at the moment. Mickey Hart is not only doing as good a job as he could possibly can do with Tyrone. I think what they showed last year was a fairly sizable overachievement. Now, thanks to Mayo and Kerry, there was an overachievement to be had from somebody because of their underachievement. But Mickey Hart took advantage I get the of that situation. Vote. I get the casting vote here, lads. Uh, before this debate started, I would have said that, yes, Mickey Hart, that era should have ended a couple of years ago. But Owen's debating skills have won this one, Shane. You've let yourself down. Absolutely I think not. that there's no point in there right. now. I, I think for the Toronto transition... By the end argument. of the year, are they going to be closer to winning the All-Ireland or not? I'd say Mayo will pass them out. I think for Toronto, not pass well. them out. They'll get back to the, to the normal level of where they should be. Which, which is means being, Tyrone will drop. Well, no, it's not, it's be not because of them dropping up. It's because of Mayo and Kerry coming back up to where they deserve to be, which is the second and third best team Tyrone, in the Tyrone needed to make a change two or three years ago so that they would be in position now to win an All-Ireland. You've got recency bias. He spoke second, so therefore you... I had persuaded <laughs> right. you at first okay, that whatever. he spoke second. All right, that's everything for the Gaelic football show today. We have two very exciting announcements on Off the Ball today. Uh, this morning there was big news of Ron O'Gara signing for Off the Ball, as I mentioned earlier, and you're going to want to listen in to tonight's show from 7pm for some more big GA news. We'll be back with the Hurling Show tomorrow from 3 o'clock, and we'll have the Gaelic Football Show every Wednesday at 12.30. We'll chat to you then.